do you have to hold knowledge of the gospel to be saved? And the follow-up question, I think, informs where they were trying to take that. Do you, do you have to hold knowledge of the gospel to be saved? Can those with intellectual disabilities be saved? You know, as I... Go ahead, Steve. It's your turn. I think a couple of things. I think, number one, as we look in Scripture, we do have the simplicity of the sinner's prayer. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And I think there is a basic realization there. And I think that's different than someone who is knowingly rejecting a proposition of the gospel. Um, has, has maybe explored the doctrine of the Incarnation and has adopted an heretical view of Christ as the God-man. I think we can see that as a barrier and a hindrance to the gospel while not expecting anyone to have a saving faith, to have the articulation of a Nicene Chalcedonian formulation of the Incarnation. So, as I think about this notion of the propositions that are necessary to the gospel, that are necessary to a saving faith, I think we can distinguish between those that are rejecting the propositions and then that simple plea, that simple sinner's prayer, Lord, have mercy on me, and recognizing uh, my sinfulness and recognizing my substitute. And maybe not able to articulate a full Christological statement, uh, but recognizing those fundamental truths. You know, I think just to emphasize what you said this morning, you can't believe a false gospel and be saved. But you can believe the true gospel without a full understanding of every aspect of the full gospel, because we would all agree that probably every one of us was saved with a less than complete understanding of all the richness of the gospel. Uh, maybe this is something that will help. People continually ask, practically, how do you present the gospel? Um, how should we present the gospel? And I would just give you just a simple little pattern to think of. Um, you, have, you have one access point to a sinner, and only one. And that is the sinner knows he's a sinner because the law of God is written in his heart and his conscience accuses him. You, you have no access with regard to the gospel in the sense of who God is or who Christ is because that knowledge is alien to him. He understands not the things of God. But what the sinner does understand is his own sin. And that is why life is so hard for the sinner. That is why there's so little satisfaction, fulfillment, hope, joy, meaning, significance. That is why he drinks, takes drugs, changes partners, because there's a wretchedness in his own soul. Look, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, and who can know it in the sense that you know it well enough to do something to change it? But the sinner knows he's a sinner. So the, the only possible way you can initially approach a sinner and have him affirm you is to confront the sinfulness of that person. That's why the Apostle Paul says that he, uh, he, he proclaims the manifestation of the truth in 2 Corinthians 4 and even, even commends himself to non-believers. How do you commend the gospel to a non-believer? How do you get a, a, a non-believer to say, wow, that's the truth? Not by preaching the resurrection at, at the first, not by preaching the deity of Christ. You commend yourself to the sinner with regard to the gospel when you tell the sinner what he already knows, that he is sinful. And the first thing you do then is to confront the sinner at the point of contact of his sin, call for repentance and the cost of repentance. Okay, that's, that's the entry point. 
Do you understand that you're a sinner? Do you desire to be delivered from the presence, power, and consequence of your sin? Here's the cost of that repentance. The second thing is to say, God has made a provision if you repent for you to be forgiven and delivered from that sin. That's where you talk about the person and work of Christ. And then the next thing you say with joy is, if you repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and His work, God promises to forgive your sin and take you into eternal heaven. Um, that, I think, puts the point of contact at the only place that it's viable for the sinner. You say, well, the sinner may reject that confrontation. There's nowhere else to go, right? You don't need a Savior if you don't know you're a sinner. What, what are you being saved from? That, only, only those crushed, broken under the weight of their own sin, fearing the judgment of God, flee to the salvation that's offered. So I think that first approach identifies whether the Spirit of God at that point has prepared that heart. How else do you know that the Spirit has done the work that you can't do? You can throw the seed, you can't plow the soil. So how do you know when the Spirit's prepared a heart? When there's an eagerness for repentance, a willingness to pay the price of repentance because the desperation is that high and all they want to know is what do I do to be saved? 